Hey everybody and welcome to the Complete Dentures 1 lecture course at New York City College of Technology, the uh, Department of Restorative Dentistry. Uh, this is the third lecture installment of the set, so it's the third module. If you're partaking in this course, it is completely available on your Blackboard. And this week's lecture is on custom trays. We're going to cover a little bit about what we did last week, and then we're going to get into a little bit more about stock trays and custom trays, how to fabricate them, and uh, what are the specific characteristics that are necessary for a custom tray to be efficient. So let's take a look at what we discussed last week. So steps for the completion of a denture. Now up until now we've spoken about taking preliminary impressions, evaluating those preliminary impressions, what kind of stone we use to pour those preliminary impressions, which was buff stone or dental stone, uh, all the same things, just different names allocated for the same thing. We spoke about uh, right the, the use of a stock tray and kind of comparing it to buying a small, medium, large shirt or suit at Target or something of the sort, and then kind of going to a tailor and getting a tailored suit, which is more like a custom tray. Right? Everybody's mouth is unique to their own, uh, kind of like a fingerprint. So therefore, a small, medium, large tray doesn't necessarily fit as well as it should to capture the pri proper anatomical landmarks to fabricate a complete denture. So with that said, uh, on those preliminary casts that we create from the preliminary impressions, we fabricate uh, something called a custom tray, which we're going to talk about today. Now with that custom tray, uh, the doctor or clinician then takes a custom tray impression. It's then returned to the uh, dental laboratory where a technician bead box and pours the custom tray impression. Uh, on those models, we fabricate something called an occlusal rim, which we'll get into uh, in the next lecture. Then we receive and articulate those occlusal rims on an articulator. We spoke about what an articulator is in the first class, basically a piece of equipment that simulates the opening and closing of the human jaw. And then we're at the point where we would set uh, teeth and wax and we do a trial setup that goes to the dental office where the clinician or dentist tries in the wax trial teeth and then we would receive it back and finish up uh, waxing and creating uh, gingival characterization on the case and uh, we would do a final trial if necessary or possibly process the case. But we'll get more into depth when it comes to the steps in fabricating these uh, probably a little later in the semester. So as we talk about a custom tray and what that is, uh, first we have to answer the question, yeah, what is a custom tray, right? And why do we need to fabricate a custom tray? Here we have an image of what a custom tray may look like. This one is actually made out of a uh, cold cure acrylic, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. So when we talk about what is a custom tray and why do we need to fabricate one, well, let's dive into it a little bit and take a look for ourselves, right? So what we have in front of us is a preliminary impression. Now, although this material is not uh, alginate impression material like we spoke about, uh, in last lecture session, um, it is a, an impression material used for preliminary impressions. So when we look at preliminary impressions and we look at what we see here is a plastic stock tray, right? So like we spoke about, you can buy these stock trays in small, medium, large type sizes. Um, we'll talk about the different types that they come in. Uh, the prefabricated trays are made to fit everyone moderately well but it will not fit everyone. Now the plastic ones are adaptable. Um, you can apply some heat to them, stretch them, morph them, but overall the length of the borders and things of that nature are not custom to each individual patient, right? So what a custom trade does is that it provides a dentist with an impression material carrier that permits to make a more accurate impression than they could making use of a stock prefabricated tray. So a custom tray is made on the diagnostic cast, also referred to as your preliminary cast, 
uh, which you have obtained through pouring your preliminary impressions. All right, so we talked all about that in the last two lecture sessions, and now we're here making our way towards the fabrication of a custom tray. So we spoke about different types of trays. So one of them visually here are metal stock trays. Uh, these were very common at one point in time, however, now uh, not so common. Um, disposables seem to be uh, more sanitary, easy to keep up with. These metal stock trays were uh, definitely more affordable because of the concept that you can sterilize these in an autoclave machine um, if you needed to for reuse and things of that nature. So these were reusable stock trays. But we also see more commonly now that plastic stock trays are used uh, throughout dentistry. These are just used for single use and then disposed of once the impression has been poured. So what happens when we receive that preliminary impression? We spoke about we need to receive a lab sheet also known as an RX or a prescription or a script from a, a dentist or a clinician telling us uh, that they would need the custom tray. So with that RX or script, we also receive the model or impression. Uh, more commonly, it's usually the impression. Uh, so we pour that up. Um, sometimes you'll see that the dentist will draw the borders or outlines of the proposed custom tray on the diagnostic cast if they poured the cast for you uh, and gives other design directions. Uh, in many cases, you're not going to see dentists taking the time to draw an outline for you and really dictate how they want a custom tray to be fabricated. Uh, however, it does occur. Uh, some dentists will have assistance, pour a model, and then evaluate the model before sending it to the laboratory. But all the information and any excess information is always good information. So things they might dictate to you is the kind of handle position they're looking for. Uh, you may see different variations of a handle, handles that are located on the palate, handles that are located uh, towards the anterior residual ridge area, handles that are uh, dipped out at 45 degrees, 90 degrees, large handles that are like the thickness of a thumb, small handles that are just enough to grab and get leverage on. Uh, it varies throughout preference of the doctor. And we have the amount and placement of wax spacer. So we'll talk about what wax spacer is and why uh, we would use it. And then vertical stops or tissue stops, which we'll talk about as well. So the Air Force talks about some of the more popular ways of making a custom tray. We have a self-curing resin dome method, which is basically a cold cure acrylic. Uh, it's mixed monomer and polymer, polymer monomer being the uh, liquid, polymer being the powder. Uh, when mixed together, uh, it creates a chemical reaction called polymerization where the acrylic goes through certain stages. It becomes doughy and then becomes a hard uh, resin or acrylic. Uh, this can be rolled out kind of like uh, pizza dough and then shaped into the shape of the desired custom tray. And then we have a vacuum method uh, that's spoken about in the Air Force Manual as well. Something that's not uh, as commonly used today. Uh, we would use a large uh, vacuum machine that would use the power of air uh, or what people used to call a suck down machine. And uh, the material would sit on a plate with metal holes in it. Uh, well, the object would sit on the plate, the model, and then there'd be a heating element that heats a material uh, like a sheet it begins to droop and get soft. The material is then laid over the model and then uh, suction and air pressure is used to kind of adapt the uh, model, uh, the material over the model and create your custom tray. Uh, this is something that's once again not more, most commonly used today. And then we have another one that is like your material. Like your materials used for uh, a variety of different things in dentistry nowadays. And uh, it is very common that you'll see a custom tray made out of light cured material. And obviously due to uh, advances in CAD CAM technology, uh, another way that's not listed in the Air Force Manual is the 3D printing of resin material uh, for custom trays. So in your lab classes, you should be exposed to both the self-curing resin dough method 
and the light curing methods used to fabricate a custom tray. So when it comes to custom trays, how are we going to fabricate one? So let's talk a little bit about what is a custom tray and why is the term undercuts important, right? Uh, what are the steps really is what we're going to be talking about. So first we're going to use base plate wax to generously fill in all undercuts within the tray area outlined on the cast. Now when we talk about undercuts, we need to understand what that means, right? So what's an undercut? The Air Force Manual will define it as the portion of the surface of an object that is below the height of contour in relationship to the path of placement. Uh, it's a lot of words and it could be too wordy to the point where it kind of gets confusing. Uh, so if we break down the terms here, one of the terms that if you don't know the definition of, it can very much confuse you, is height of contour. Now what height contour is referring to is the basically the widest portion of an object. So if we look at this image here and we see the uh, knife being pressed up perpendicular to the peak of that residual ridge, we notice that there is a large open space between the knife and the model. All right. That open space there is your undercut area. As the knife rests against the height of contour of the residual ridge, the space underneath it, right? So as it says in the definition, the portion of the surface of an object that is below the height of contour, that space uh, presented by uh, the knife there is below your height of contour. So that is your undercut, right? When we think about how a denture would be placed, it'd be inserted path of placement directly on top of that model at a 90 degree angle. So that means that uh, the knife being perpendicular, that is how the denture would be seated onto the model. So that space underneath that knife area, underneath your height of contour is an undercut, right? So how can you kind of easily determine what an undercut is? Uh, like I said, you can take a flat surface, kind of place it perpendicular, thinking about how you would insert or seat a denture on top of the model, and all those spaces that occur on, uh, between the, the flat edge of the knife and the model, uh, you can designate those as undercuts. And you can see in the image to the left here that the undercuts in the anterior region underneath the residual ridge areas have been blocked out with wax because they are uh, undercut areas. Now when we talk about why block out the undercut areas, it's very difficult to uh, to think about you know what's the purpose of an undercut, what's the reason. Um, basically the concept that I like to use uh, in this generic form is that uh, imagine someone who is um, severely overweight, uh, right, a big big beer belly. If uh, a person is wearing a belt, that belt usually sits underneath their height of contour per se, right? Which means that, uh, you know, the, the belt and the pants do not go up past the circumference, the widest portion, the height of contour of a belly, right? So thinking about that uh, and regarding it to the undercut of a denture, uh, there are going to be times where you want to engage an undercut like that to secure an object or, or an appliance and then times where you're not going to want to engage it. So if you're wearing a denture, you're an edentulous person, you obviously want your denture to have retention and you want it to fit well and snug against your tissue and bone structures. So in that scenario, you would want to engage undercuts. Now in this scenario where we are here where we're creating a custom tray, Right? Think about how if you ever had an impression done at a dental office, those trays kind of slide in and out easy without much fussing of the clinician and directing the tray in a certain pattern to seat the tray uh, intraorally. So with that said, you would say that you would not want to have a custom tray that engages undercuts. You're more so looking for a tray that seats passively onto the model, which is easy to insert, take an impression, and then easy to retrieve without locking it in place. So in this scenario, uh, we will be looking to block out any major undercuts before the fabrication of the actual custom tray. So custom trays. The second 
step in fabricating a custom tray uh, requires a spacer in order to allow room for controlled thickness of impression material, right? So when we think about what that means, what are spacers, right? Spacers are used to develop tissue stops in order to accomplish uniform impression thickness. The stops are made to hold the tray off the cast by a distance equal to the thickness of the spacer. When the spacer is removed and the tray is placed in the patient's mouth, the stops hold the inner surface of the tray out of contact with the patient's tissue. So to put it more in layman's terms, think about it this way. You performed your initial block out with your wax on the undercuts. Next is you create a spacer, right? So that is a sheet of base plate wax. Base plate wax on average is about one millimeter thick. It gets adapted to the anatomical landmarks and traced out in a similar manner of your custom tray. So the question is, is that without creating these surface areas that you see on the picture to the right, right, the, the, the tripoded holes in, in the spacer, uh, if a custom tray was made directly on the image on the left, think about when a clinician or dentist presses the custom tray into the patient's mouth, what is going to occur? Right. And what occurs is, is that you will get premature contacts in certain areas displacing impression material. Right? So then imagine that you are going to apply custom tray material to the picture on the right. right? So what would happen is that custom tray material gets inserted into those holes you've created on the wax spacer. We then cure whatever method uh, or whatever method we're using to create the custom tray. Uh, we cure it and we fabricate it completely. Once we remove the custom tray from the model, the wax spacer is usually on the inside of the custom tray, right? So once you peel that wax spacer out, what's left on the inside of the custom tray, right? There should be basically three evenly raised areas in tripod formation inside of the custom tray, right? So what that means is that those three spots will make initial contact on the tissue. And because they're in tripod formation, they will hold the custom tray off of the tissue one millimeter away, right? Because the wax that was there was one millimeter thick. So this allows for uniform impression material thickness, which then results in a very accurate impression setting time uh, or setting accuracy. So without the spacer, the custom tray will prove to be tight against the tissue and could result in distortion or movement of any of the soft tissues. Um, so it could result in an inaccurate final impression. And when we look at the picture on the right, it should be noted that uh, when making these tissue stops, you want to place them in tripod formation, but you also want to be sure to steer clear from any points of tissue that are soft and mobile. Uh, putting a tissue stop directly on an incisive papilla, as you see in the image to the right, sometimes may not be a good idea. If the incisive papilla is uh, very soft and mobile, the tissue stop and the pressure applied during the impression taking procedure could displace the incisive papilla, which then may result in discomfort uh, during the final insertion of a denture. Okay. And a little tip here that uh, we used at Rutgers University was that uh, using tin foil over your wax uh, will make it easy for you to clean the inside of your custom tray. Depending on the method you're using to fabricate your custom tray, uh, the wax may melt, um, so it may become a little messy. In that case, tin foil, substitute, uh, tin foil works well. Or you can also just place Vaseline on top of the wax space or the separating medium so that the wax is easily removed from the inside of the custom tray. So two uh, small tips that you can use uh, to aid in the cleansability of your custom tray once it's fabricated. So another thing you want to be sure of is to free all of your muscle attachments from impingement as seen in this illustration here. And one of the things that you have to think about as far as why would you want to free a muscle attachment is uh, the concept of when pulling your lip, you can probably locate a few muscle attachments or freedoms within your mouth. Uh, and moving your lip side to side, you'll also notice that those muscle attachments or freedoms are mobile. 
As they are mobile, this means that they need the freedom to move during function, right? When eating, when creating faces, uh, facial expressions, speaking, your lips are constantly moving, which means that your freedoms are moving. If you do not compensate for that space and capture these freedoms accurately, uh, it could pose a problem during insertion of the denture. And one can cause pain, and two, it can cause the denture to dislodge. So it is important to assess these uh, individual freedoms or muscle attachments and free them accordingly, even during the custom tray fabrication process. So one of the ways of fabricating a custom tray out of acrylic or self-curing resin, as uh, described before, is that you're always going to follow the manufacturer's directions for monomer and polymer ratios when mixing. You're going to mix the monomer and polymer components of the autopolymerizing resins. Allow the mixture to set until it reaches a doughy-like consistency and wear gloves when handling the resin. Uh, it's not a good idea to not wear gloves. You don't want that monomer uh, seeping into your skin. Um, so always important to wear the proper PPE. So some more steps in fabricating an acrylic custom tray. Uh, you're going to lightly coat uh, the glove fingers with Vaseline before handling the dough so that it does not become a sticky mess. Make sure that the mold is coated with Vaseline. You're going to place the resin into a stone mold, which you'll see in a video a little later on. And cover the resin with a polyethylene sheet and roll it out, uh, almost like uh, a pizza dough. So what you see underneath there is the stone template they're talking about. Um, the blue sheet in between is your acrylic and the plastic sheets that are on top of the acrylic are your polyethylene sheets. So to give you a visual here, what happens is the powder and the liquid form of the acrylic, polymer and monomer, get mixed together. As you mix it, polymerization occurs and the um, acrylic goes through stages. Eventually it becomes uh, in its doughy state and it actually gets treated like dough as you see. So the stone template kind of shapes the uh, acrylic dough into a sheet that is usable. So once you have rolled the acrylic into a usable sheet, it can then be applied over the model. So you're going to trim any excess dough and lift uh, the acrylic resin blank from the mold and once you have that sheet of dough in your hand you can store any excess acrylic in the jar to use later to make your handle. You're going to center the resin over the cast and rapidly adapt the dough to the cast surface as you see in the image here and you want to be careful to not create any thin spots by pressing too hard because the entire sheet is pliable and pressing too hard you might just uh, create perforations in the certain areas of the tray so you'll have a tray that is not uniform in thickness and it'll have weak spots that could cause fracture or break during the impression taking procedure. So while the dough is still soft, you can shape the resin to the borders and cut away the excess with a sharp knife. You can attach the handle at that point using acrylic. You can adapt it and, and all the excess you have cut away from the model, you can then shape into a handle and apply it onto the, uh, the custom tray surface that you created. Um, ensure that the handle is strong enough to withstand considerable force and its shape does not interfere with lip movements. Usually the tray is placed or the handle on the tray is placed at about 45 degree angles. Uh, and that's to avoid, especially on the maxillary, uh, the upper lip and cause discomfort for the patient. Uh, when polymerization reaches the doughy stage, you can then kind of tweak the handle and form it into an L shape. Uh, and using a few drops of monomer to moisten the attachment site between the handle and the tray, the monomer kind of blends the handle of the tray into the custom tray itself, so it ends up looking as if it was one piece. Uh, you can press the base of the handle into the moistened area and fluid monomer should provide a pretty good bonding between the handle and the tray. So real quick, everything we just spoke about, you have your preliminary models, you blocked out your undercuts, uh, you should have put a wax spacer in place and this demonstration one is not used. You can see how the dough has been rolled out, it then gets applied to the cast. 
uh, handle is placed and then you can see the difference between uh, the rough form of a custom tray once the acrylic is adapted versus what a tray looks like once it's finished and cleaned and polished. Uh, now this method is probably the most economic. Uh, you can buy this acrylic in large bulk and form these custom trays yourself from scratch. However, there is more labor involved. And as you can see, the difference from figure E to F, E is, it was extremely bulky, the borders are overextended, and the uh, overall tray seems thick in comparison to figure F. Looking at figure F, we can see the tray has been trimmed significantly, which shows that this could have taken uh, probably a significant amount of time to get it to this point. So some more popular ways of making custom trays. Uh, well, one was a vacuum method. This actually gives you a uniform thickness throughout. You don't have to worry about forming the tray yourself, uh, but it's all very similar. Um, so here, uh, the instructions for using a vacuum method. Uh, you have the cast design created, uh, positioning a handle prior, uh, and the substructure with some wet tissue there. Uh, the material then gets adapted on the vacuum form machine, as we spoke before. And then once it's adapted, it gets cut away with the disc, and it can be trimmed and polished. And uh, you basically have a tray that's already formed very nicely to the model uh, with a small spacing used from the wet tissue paper. And now what's something that is a little more common uh, is a light cure uh, custom tray material. So some of this material sometimes can slump. So you'll see in this example in figure A, uh, we can adapt the material to the block out cast and form a substructure for the handle using a wire. The wire kind of supports the handle sometimes when not using the wire, depending on the light cure material you're using from what company. It could be uh, a little soft and it can slump. So a lot of the times what I see is that uh, students will form a custom tray out of light cure material with a handle that's in a great position and they put it in the light box and step away. Uh, this light cure material does not cure instantly so what can occur is that if there's not support on the handle it can slump as it's curing. So the handle position can fall and then it's not as good as it was uh, when the custom tray was first designed. So it's important that uh, that little metal wire substructure uh, is a good way to make sure that the handle doesn't lose its position while it's in the carrying line. So once you've formed your custom tray, uh, obviously all this, the previous steps are the same. You have your block out wax, you've put your spacer, and then on top you're applying your light care material. Uh, there'll be a instructional video for step-by-step -step procedures when it comes to fabricating a custom tray using the light care material. Um, and we're just looking at what that looks like. And this ha probably has the least amount of labor involved. Uh, like your material is very easy to work with. It's easy to be cut and trimmed in a soft state and it has minimal finishing. So a very quick look at what some custom trays may look like. These handles are larger. You can see that the tissue stops are present. Uh, borders are uh, slightly overextended in some areas. Uh, but once again, custom trays become somewhat of a preference when it comes to what the dentist or clinician wants. But you do want to follow some general uh, procedures and standards and protocols. And some of those things include like the handle position should always be away from the lip. Borders should always be uh, slightly uh, shorter than the full depth of the sulcus or peripheral roll areas. Uh, things of that nature. Uh, but some technicians or clinicians might prefer to make custom trays without tissue stops. Um, according to the Air Force, tissue stops are necessary, handle position is necessary, and they're looking for about three millimeters away from the deepest part of the sulcus areas, as far as the borders go for a custom tray. So once the custom tray is fabricated, no matter what method used, the custom tray is sent to the dentist or clinician. The dentist or clinician is then going to take an impression with the custom tray, right? So the question is, well, what are they going to use? Are they just going to use alginate again or uh, another preliminary impression material that's used for preliminary impressions? And can, can we use alginate if we really wanted to? 
So uh, a few things. So in complete denture work, an impression material is needed that accurately registers all of the denture bearing areas, right? So what do we mean by that? What are the denture bearing areas? We're talking about the sulcus, the residual ridge, the retromylohoid space, frenums, okay? So what's commonly used or really what's referenced within the Air Force is, is, is more accurate. Uh, zinc oxide eugenol paste, uh, but really anything that is a polyvinyl siloxane material, a uh, very common one, I'll give you a name of, of, of a common impression material would be impergum. Um, it's something that's used for final impressions throughout dentistry. Uh, but something like that, the impression material can be used for final complete denture impressions and draw relationship records because it holds dimensional stability well and it's pretty rigid. Okay. So, you know, if you ask yourself the question, why can't I use alginate? If any of you have ever had an alginate impression and you think about what happens when they put that thick alginate into your mouth and you can see it in the video where we show our, our patient getting his preliminary impressions, the alginate is very viscous, right? Very thick. So as you squeeze the impression material into the mouth, Alginate kind of rolls over the impression tray and fills that sulcus full of material. So when you pour this preliminary model, you're actually getting tissue that is fully stretched, right? And when you think about how a denture fits, a denture is fitting and has to fit while lips are at rest, uh, the mouth is in function, and all these other factors that fall into the category of being able to kind of function with a denture. So basically what I'm trying to say is that when using alginate impression materials, you end up getting kind of over-exaggerated, over-extended sulcus areas, which then ends up with, if you were to fabricate a denture on these over-extended areas, the denture would then be over-extended. So this can result in many things. It can result in one... Uh, a very uncomfortable patient. Uh, two, the denture doesn't fit at all. Or three, the patient is coming back for multiple adjustments because the length of the borders of the denture just don't uh, allow the patient to function properly and comfortably. So all these factors really play a role and that's why really alginate impression material should not be used for a final impression to fabricate a final denture on unless we're speaking possibly something about an immediate denture, which is covered in a different course. Uh, so for now, we're going to focus on our complete dentures. So as we talk about the ability to kind of evaluate, what are we looking for, right? What makes a good impression? Why would we need a custom tray? And what should I be looking for to say, this isn't a great preliminary impression. We really do need a custom tray and these are the areas that we're missing, right? So can you really look here and see what areas are missing? And when looking at it, if you can quiz yourself and say to yourself, well, what are those anatomical landmarks called and what's really missing here? So when we look at it, these are the areas missing, all right? So one of the things that we're missing here is that you find that the posterior palatal area, right where your vibrating line is, and more importantly, your posterior palatal seal, which will aid in the retention factor of your denture. Uh, we'll get more into what a posterior palatal seal is and how it's really something used during the fabrication process to offset shrinkage that occurs during the uh, polymerization of acrylic. But, uh, but yes, it's an area that is necessary for the proper fit of a denture. So posterior palatal seal area is missing there. The palatine raft is missing up there towards the center, uh, up by your rugae, and then by your tuberosities, right? Uh, you can see that the impression material has not rounded itself, and it hasn't really caught all of that surface, right? And then we look at, you know, what happens when we create a custom tray? What happens when we properly extend those custom tray borders? And what happens when we use a material that's not so viscous, right? Well, this can be a possible result. So no impression's perfect. There are some areas here that could use improvement. However, in comparison to the corresponding landmarks, it's easy to see what was missed in the preliminary stock tray impression versus the custom tray impression. We can see here that most of those areas that were missing have not been captured. Um, 
So this is something on the left that would be usable for the fabrication of a complete custom, uh, complete denture, while the stock tray on the right uh, would prove that if we made this, if we used this impression to pour a final cast to fabricate a denture on, you'd probably have issues with retention and fit. So custom trays are really necessary when it comes to the fabrication of a complete denture. So once the impression is taken by the dentist, we then receive those impressions back, right? So what would be our following step? Well, it would just be the same as if we received a preliminary impression. We would take that impression, we disinfect it, right? Using universe, universal precaution systems. And then we would uh, bead box and pour the impression. And that brings us to our next point. Something that we didn't do with an alginate impression since we were gonna make a custom tray anyway, is we did not bead, box, and pour. So what does that mean? What is bead, boxing, and pouring? Bead, boxing, and pouring is basically, in layman's terms, you're almost creating a cup around the impression that's given to you, All right? And this allows you to pour your model with uniform thickness and helps you create a land area on the cast, All right? So what are the steps that, uh, are needed in order to perform this beading and boxing. So first is that you're going to take your beading wax to create your land area. So you're going to take that strip and kind of line it against the border and you can see how the border is kind of showing in the impression uh, at least about a millimeter to two. And that kind of gives you a circumference around the impression to then have a land area. What a land area gives you is kind of a marker of the end of the anatomical landmarks, right? It also gives you a baseline for uh, depth of sulcus area and things of that nature. So the first step is beading and then is boxing. So as we stated, when you look at the boxing, uh, it's almost as if you were creating a cup around your impression. You can see here on the image on the right that uh, the beading was done first and then the boxing after. Uh, and then once you do that, you're able to pour stone into that, uh, that bead and box that you've created. Now, um, sometimes it can be tricky. Sometimes impression material can be a little moist, a little wet, uh, makes things a little difficult. But overall, this is a process that you're capable of doing. And at the end of the day, when thinking about accuracy of the yield of the pour, what I mean by that is think about how alginists were shown to you prior. Uh, it is typical practice of a technician to pour an alginate impression quickly and then flip it, right? But there is an issue with that. When we think about what happens when you pour an impression and flip it, you just poured all of that stone into anatomical areas that are necessary to fabricate an appliance or, or a, a prosthetic. So by flipping it upside down and the stone is not completely set, what's occurring? And the answer is gravity. Gravity is occurring, right? So even though it's minuscule, even though it might not be noticed, stone is still pulling away slowly from the impression. So that is why beadboxing and pouring, especially for anything that's going to receive a final restoration, uh, it's an important step because it allows the stone to kind of sit and set uh, and allow gravity to kind of pull itself into those anatomical landmarks and you get something that's a little more accurate. So once again, what are the steps to pouring this type of impressions? You're going to disinfect the impressions, uh, use the bubbleizer, mix your stone and water, beadbox and pour the impression, then you'll let the stone set and then separate. And you will have your final stone models. And we see here they have a very uniform thickness and you can see that bead of land area around the entire uh, circumference of these models. So that kind of covers the idea of what a custom tray is, why we would need to use one, what are important factors in custom tray fabrication, what are the different methods or common methods used. Uh, we kind of covered all the most generic overview of custom trays, especially in reference to the Air Force Manual. So please brush up in your Air Force Manual within the custom tray section. Give yourself an idea of how to fabricate using those different methods we spoke about in the lecture today. I will also place a reading assignment within your module so that you have pages to reference uh, within your Air Force manual. 
And lastly, sometimes I like to add a little change of life, a little story behind what we do and how we change people's lives. Uh, so what we see here is something we discussed briefly. It's called an immediate denture. So what we see on the left is how patient presents themselves. Uh, basically a patient with failing dentition that needs multiple extractions. So uh, what happens during this visit is that we receive models that have dentition on them that are designated to be failed and will receive extraction. So the concept is, is that if a patient has teeth that are getting extracted, think about the steps involved. We can't perform things like a custom tray. Uh, if teeth are loose, sometimes that uh, zinc eugenol oxide paste or the PBS impression materials, they're very tight. So sometimes if teeth are that damaged or, or unhealthy, uh, an impression can actually pull teeth out of the mouth. So a lot of the times we are left with alginate impressions to fabricate these dentures. The other concept is that we can't make occlusal rims. If a patient has majority of teeth in their mouth, there's no way to make occlusal rims, which we'll talk about a little bit more next semester. But basically, there's no way to try in a trial denture. There's no way to see if the teeth look good in the mouth because there's teeth there now. So the concept is, is that we take those models and we, the technician, begin to remove the teeth and extract them from the model. We use the existing teeth as a guide to place new denture teeth. And you can see here that the end result is a complete denture set based off of preliminary models. And then these dentures are processed in acrylic. And the day that the patient comes in, they're able to get their extractions performed and get teeth inserted. So basically, immediate dentures are a way that a patient never has to be without teeth. Right? The day of their extractions, they get these dentures inserted and they're able to go home uh, with a full set of teeth. So just a little insight into what immediate dentures are. We'll cover that more in Dentures 3 course. If you decide to enroll, it is an elective. Well, that's all I have for you today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, any questions, feel, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, be sure to perform all of your assignments within Module 3. And uh, I'll be talking to you soon. Have a great day or night.